Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, this is um, I'm a broad spectre here. I'm going from one extreme to the other. So I will be talking a bit about flood forecasting and how we have uh, implemented um, two systems at ECNWF, one European system and one global system. And I will focus on the European system because that has gone further in its operational development. And I will, we also have a study there on, on seasonal forecasting. So the, the outline of my talk today will be first a short introduction to hydrology. For those of you who may not know as much about hydrology, so I'll give some specific. Yeah, okay. Um, so I will, I will talk about the two systems we have, European system and global system. And then I will show a bit on a case study we have done looking at, at S2S in hydrological forecasting as well. This is still work under development, so we just started looking at uh, taking hydrological forecasting to the, to the sub-season of the seasonal scale as well. So, uh, flooding is, is really, really a global challenge. Um, this is a picture from uh, something called the Dartmouth Flood Observatory. And it's a US system where they have looked, they're using uh, satellite imagery to, to monitor floods. And these are the reported floods in 2010. As the picture shows here, you, have, you basically have floodings all over the globe. So it's really something that is abundant all over the world. But there's difference also in the frequency of uh, where this happens. Let me get this to work. Oh. So <clears throat> some countries are more flood prone than others, obviously. So here's another picture showing the number of occurrences of flood by country. Um, from 1974 to 2003, so it's a 30 year period. And you can see some countries showing up in red, showing that they have more, more abundant floods. Uh, <clears throat> South America, uh, Southeast Asia, and the US are very flood prone. But no matter where you are in the world, you can, you can be hit by a dev devastating flood. So it's very important to try to capture the um, possibility to, to forecast these, these floods, these events. I don't know if this is out of battery or not. This is not really... Okay. I use the fingers here anyway. So what, what causes the flooding? Well, there can be many things. Uh, in the Nordic or, or in the uh, snow-fed catchments, we have a lot of snow melt runoff. So in the spring, we, we can expect to get a flood. But sometimes this is more, more larger than other times. And of course, rainfall, um, obviously, either a short, a very intense rainfall or a long, uh, prolonged season, like the monsoon season, can give uh, large floods. You can also have obstructions in, in the river discharge, in the, <coughs> in the river, that causes an ice jam or, or another tree that, that causes the dam, and then you get a, a, can get a devastating flood from this. You have also coastal storms. You have urban stormwater runoff when you have a large intensity precipitation event hitting a, a, a city, for example. You also have dam failures. So you have, the, of course, dam failure is very difficult. You can't really forecast it. But all the other ones, uh, we have a pretty good idea of how to forecast it. Maybe not the ice jams and destructions, but all the other things. We, we, we do have a capability of, of forecasting these events. And the way we do this is, um, through a chain. So we are starting off with the meteorological input, which here is shown as the EPS. So that is the ensemble prediction system. You can also use a deterministic model, but uh, today most centers are, are really using the probabilistic forecasting in, in hydrology. And you can use a, a pre-processing, a calibration of your, of your input data, and then you fed it feed it through a hydrological model. And the hydrological model is basically taking the precipitation and temperature and evapotranspiration, routing it through the, the soil, groundwater, and producing discharge. You also get other things like soil moisture, groundwater recharge, um, lakes, and other things as well. So it can be quite a complex model. Very similar to a land surface model is, is basically a type of hydrological model. You can use those for, for flood forecasting as well. And then you get the output, and usually you do some post-processing. And then you compare this to, for example, a climatological mean, and you come up with a warning, depending on the situation. And then you can also use uh, verification tools to, to feedback into a model. So this is, this is what we, our system looks like. 
And because we're not perfect. So the two main reasons why forecast fails is that uh, we don't have enough information on initial conditions. As I talked about yesterday, the poor coverage of data is, is a problem in the global level. So we have, um, we can have also errors in the data simulation in our, in our models. So we can have a lot of problems with the initial uncertainties. Basically, we do not really know where we're starting from. <clears throat> but also, the model is always just a, um, a description of reality. And we might not capture the right uh, things we are the true atmospheric phenomena that we, that we want to capture. So we also have a lot of model uncertainties as well. And uh, we are working in a chaotic system, so we can't really forecast these events on a very, um, well, we, most of the time, but we do have, a, have to be consideration that we get a lot of forecast fails as well. So that was a very quick hydraulic introduction. So now we're going to move into the um, two operational systems that we are running at DCNWF. First off is the European flood awareness system. And uh, it's a transboundary system, so it um, gives, has 50 partners in our network that receives these forecasts. And they provide observations and also feedback on, on the performance of our warnings. And we do have a large collection of hydrometeorological data as well. So there's a very, it's a really um, two-way interaction with our, our partners. We give them the forecast, uh, they give us data and feedback, and we have a constant dialogue on how to improve the system as well. And it's basically, it's um, covering most of Europe. We are extending now eastwards as well. So Turkey and, and Ukraine and, and Belarus will be included in the system as well. And uh, we have a number of partners giving forecast to the, the um, member states or the, the member organizations. And so the benefits, why we're doing this? Well, this is an added value to the national hydraulic services. Usually they have their own information on a very local scale. But we are trying to give uh, forecasts on the longer lead times, up to 15 days, and probabilistic forecasts. So we are really trying to push into this um, as far as we can, into the sub-seasonal. But it's, it's, with the system, currently we're only using the 15-day forecast, so we can't really say we're doing any seasonal forecast yet. And um, we are providing also novel tools, te new techniques to use the data, uh, for example, satellite data, or ways to uh, calibrate the model and make it better. And of course, we also have a very important role to, to serve the European Commission, because in a crisis, they want to have comparable information across Europe. And it has been used in two cases quite recently, both in the, in the flood in Europe in 2013 and the Balkan flood last year. This system showed proved very useful. Uh, for them, it's a tool to anticipate the management during a crisis. They can uh, contact the, the civil protection agencies and uh, see what they want and what they need. They can also um, um, uh, use other kind of services, for example, the mapping service in Copernicus. So Copernicus is this uh, large uh, project that is using satellite imagery to, to really benefit um, the European countries. So this part, this uh, IFAS is part of these uh, Copernicus services. So the way we do our forecasting, our, our prediction, it's, um, I explained it briefly before, but just going more into detail. So we're starting off with a, a large set of historical data. Uh, we have uh, maps, we have um, uh, different layers of soil type, uh, vegetation, and all that is fed, fed into a flood database. And from this, we, we produce a hydraulic model. And the forecast typically looks like this for, for a typical location. So you have your starting conditions here. Here's time on this scale. And here is discharge in cubic meters per second. So we have uh, the, the proxy observations, which is the modeled water discharge. And then we can reach, come up to the forecast date here. And then we feed through our uh, ensemble predictions systems. We are also using a, a number of different models. We are using these in WF. Ensemble, which you can see here in box plots. We're also using a deterministic ensemble, or the deterministic model from the WF, which is the red one. The black one is the German Weather Service DWD model. And they all give a discharge curve depending on the input precipitation and temperature. This is then transferred into um, um, information on whether we have a flood situation or not into an interface. And then the, the partners send an email out to the network if, there's, if they need to. And the way we <coughs> forecast assist this, of course, we have 
this is, we have a multimodal system, so we have a large number of time series. We have uh, deterministic models, we have probabilistic models. And the way we try to simplify this is that we have, from the climatology, we can calculate certain return periods. So in green is depicted the, the um, one and a half year term period, in, uh, or sorry, the two year term period. In the yellow, not the one and a half, the yellow is the two year term period, which means that on average, uh, the discharge would reach this level every two years. The red one is the five-year return period, and then we also have a purple for a 20-year return period. So these are depicting levels in the river which are um, more extreme than, than the normal conditions. It doesn't really say that they actually are damaging floods, it's just showing that something's happening. And of course, we can, we can tabulate this as well. So if, if you have the Tunisic model uh, going forward in time, we can say that we can color code it whether it hits a certain threshold, for example. Yeah. Um, we we define event which can last over more than more than a, a number of days. So we're looking at the peak threshold. The the peak threshold, the maximum threshold. So. <coughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. But it can happen over more, more, yeah, exactly. So we're looking at the maximums, yeah. Okay. Well, we, <coughs> we, we do use term periods for that. The forecasters usually are, are used to using. So it's, it's really a matter of tradition, the way, way people are using these forecasts. Yeah. Yes, you can, you, can, you can do the same thing as well, looking at percentiles. For, but but we are, it's just a, what do you call it, a protocol to use, really. <coughs> yes. Sorry, you mean the system? You're well, it is the system is really the whole uh, the whole chain. So it's, it's the hydraulic model fed by the the ensemble prediction system, and then uh, so the, it is a hydraulic model where we're, with the soil moisture and the, the groundwater and the evaporation is taken care of inside the model as well. So it's similar to, think of a land surface model if you've not worked with hydrology before. So in a land surface model you would produce runoff, and that runoff can be routed to the rivers. So that's, that's what we're doing, we're just routing the runoff to a river. So what data is used for the, the soil moisture? Well, in, in the hydraulic model we usually do not do use data simulation. We are using in just precipitation and temperature, and then over time you would develop the soil moisture. There's a problem in... Um, data simulation, for example, in, in an operational land surface model, you will have satellite data being simulated every day. And that, but that is more the purpose to um, have a good feedback to the atmosphere from the land surface model. But the problem is that it will um, destroy the water balance in the, in the model. So you would either add or subtract water as you go along to, to because your, your goal with the data simulation is not to produce a perfect runoff is to do produce a better energy balance to the atmosphere. Yes. The absurd rainfall that we're using, they, that's from observation on network in Europe. So it's it's something that we have gathered from all the all the member states. And, and it's monitored right up to it's monitored right up to the to the forecast date, exactly. So we if you look at this um, figure here, everything up to here is basically monitored observation temperature run through the hydrological model and then at the starting date we switch to the um, uh, meteorological models. So we're not taking into consideration that the bias in the hydrological models that are in the meteorological models at the moment. So that's, uh, that's another issue as well, that you could do a calibration of your input data. But in this system currently we are, we are 
just feeding the, the image of models into the hydrological model. Yes? Excuse me, sorry? Uh, no, no, it's not. Yes? We're using them for, for references. For example, we're using snow, wa snow, wa uh, snow equivalent data, snow water equivalent, and we're using soil moisture to compare with our own model. So in the operational system, you can look at uh, satellite data as well, but we are currently not using it in the system, basically for the reasons that in hydrology, it has not had the same impact as in, as in metrology is improving the results. There's still a debate whether how, much you, how you should use the data and uh, how it will affect the results. One problem is it doesn't penetrate deep enough. So you can only see the top soil level, so you can't really see the, the, the water below ground. And that is very important for, for hydrology. They will interact with the rivers as well. So, so it's not like a combination of near real-time satellite products with the EPS system? Well, in the EPSS system, they are using satellite data. So in the precipitation from the EPS systems, they will have used satellite data to, for their initialization of the model. Yes. So this, you have to be um, separate the, the, how the EPS work and how the hydrology work. So in the hydraulic model, we don't do, do not do any satellite data simulation, but of course in the operational meteorological models, they, that's a very important issue. And how yeah. about the contribution of the snow uh, melt, the snow uh, water equivalent for the whole grid? So when there is a large grid, we cannot uh, Divide the influence of snow and uh, snow and... You mean within the subgrid scale variability, sort of, yeah. yeah. Subgrid variability of snow in yeah. the uh, whole grid and uh, the largest scale river basin. So if your river basin is not that much, how you can have the contribution of snow melt and the run? Uh, this system is, is set up basically on a, it's on a five kilometer grid covering Europe. Uh, so whatever happens in that one, we, we treat as a um, uniform distribution of snow. So we don't do any subgrid variability of snow. And we, 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 we also do not issue forecasts for catchments smaller than 2,000 square kilometers. So we are not, the system is not designed for very high resolution forecasts. It's really for more of the larger rivers and as an overview. We will try to go down in resolution. Um, we will improve the models continuously, but as, at the moment we are doing a five kilometer grid. And it's a rainfall runoff hydrological model or a land surface model? This is a rainfall runoff model. But I will also show an example of, of when we can use a land surface model for that. So I'll come back to that one. Uh, just to, to see how we do the, the simplification of the time series. For the, for the ensemble prediction system, we also have information on the, on the probabilities. So we do not, cannot only detect the, um, the warning level that you're, you're, you can uh, breach, but also the probability by just counting the ensemble members above a certain threshold. So we can put this all into sort of one diagram, and you can see that the evolution in time as well of how many of uh, the ensemble members predict a certain threshold. So here we're looking at... Uh, the codes here are for uh, our ensemble model above the high level and, and the severe level. And also, with, so you can see, okay, I can't really use this one. So here's um, forecast time. And then you can see at which point the models predict that, that uh, you will uh, go above some threshold. You can also put this into a two-dimensional uh, diagram where you have the forecast day on the uh, horizontal on, on the vertical axis, and then you have the uh, the forecast dates uh, on the on the horizontal, horizontal axis. So as you progress in time, you will have uh, more information. Sorry, and also you can see the jumpiness of the forecast as well. So you get closer to the event, you can see how many of the models predict a certain event happening or not. So you had some examples yesterday from a 26-day uh, lead time. That's quite impressive. That 
you would also need to, a signal like that could appear quite early in the forecast, but then you want to see that signal continuing for the next following forecast as well before, before you issue a forecast. So consistency is quite important in this context. And the system has been evaluated. We're using different um, uh, for skill scores. We also look at the number of uh, warnings we sent out and what actually happened. And this is uh, the account of the number of uh, watches and uh, alerts we have sent out. And the yellow line here is, is denoting number of hits, and the blue line, number of false alarms, and the orange one is uh, not known really. So you can see that we do have a larger number of hits than, than false alarms, which is good for a system. Uh, we also have been quite active in the last two years issuing forecasts. Uh, this is due to the two major events that was mentioned earlier, the European flood in 2013 and the Balkan floods in 2014. They were massive events and they covered a large region, which meant that we sent a lot of warnings out, a lot of alerts, but they may be counted only as one event or, or country level event. And just mentioning these two uh, events that happened, this is one in, in, um, that hit the um, northern side of the Alps. So basically, it was a, was a weather type, or weather uh, circulation was well known. I think it's called 5B, uh, where the water picked up uh, moisture from the Mediterranean and then went sort of a loop eastwards and then it came on, on from the Alps on the northern side, also picking up soil moisture as it went along. And this, this triggered an extreme precipitation event on the northern side of the Alps. And uh, if, if you remember this, this situation, there was uh, large areas that were, that were hit by, by this. And unfortunately, we did predict it, but not the severity enough. So we did underpredict it quite heavily. That has to do both with the problems in the hydrological model, but also in the meteorological model. So we, um, we should have been about 10,000. So we, we had less than half of, the, of what we should have had, or one model said about half of the actual discharge. It depended on certain stations, but where they actually had the first hit, we, we did underestimate the rainfall and the discharge. So we went back and looked at the model and see what happens if we increase the resolution. So we're looking now over a box over covering the Alps, and here is uh, total precipitation, accumulated total precipitation uh, for the um, 72 hours that this event lasted over. And the black one is the observation, so that's, that's based on observational data over this period. On the, on the vertical axis here, you have millimeters of precipitation. So currently, the green line is our uh, high-resolution Eastern DVF model. As you can see, we, we, we do underpredict the precipitation quite heavily. So, the, so we've drawn the model with different resolutions. And as you can see, the, the, this will improve with the high-resolution high as well. You will be able to capture more of the geographic uh, precipitation. You will also maybe come to a situation where you can have... Uh, completely uh, a convective, uh, not a convective precipitation, uh, a fully resolved convection, possibly. If the immediate gun to, to higher scale or, or high resolution, but you're approaching that with a five kilometer. But that's not the only thing as well. We also looked at how we can improve the, the um, physics of the, of, the, of the cloud physics, of the, of the actual rainfall generation in the cloud. So here are some examples from the very high resolution model, uh, the top four lines here, with uh, just an improved uh, cloud physics in, in the model, in the re and, and together with the increased resolution. So the top blue line there, or the purple line, is really getting close to the observations. And we are not very far off from, from reaching this resolution in the model. We are going to increase to next year to eight kilometers. Uh, that will be released sometime next year. The ensemble will be follow as well at up to 16 kilometers. So maybe in, in five, six years' time, maybe up to 10 years' time, we can, we can reach a five-kilometer resolution. That would be a major improvement for, for the, these kind of events. And here's another example from the UK where you can see how you use this kind of uh, table when you're reaching a, a flood event. So you can see, you can monitor the event have, being picked up by the ensembles quite early. But you won't do anything until you get down to where you have a more of a clear signal in your system. So you will issue a warning when you are three, four, five days ahead. But you would see the signal already uh, maybe 10 days ahead, most of, uh, quite often. We also have a flash flood system. I will not talk so much about this, just mention that we are 
doing flash flood forecasting as well on a very small scale, and this is based only on precipitation and soil moisture, a combination of those two, uh, because we have got the feedback that many countries want to have information on, on very, very high intensity rainfall. So moving over to the global scale then, we also do have a global flood awareness system, which is not operational at the moment. It's a, a research product, but it does give you a similar kind of information as with the European system, but now on a global scale. So this is what the, for, the um, interface would look like. And you can also add thing, layers like precipitation from the model as well. So you can have all kinds of, of information together with your, your um, uh, forecast information as well. So these dots here, or these, these triangles and dots, they denote whether there's a flood event forecasted or not. So they, if you have a pointing upwards triangle, you will have an um, increasing uh, discharge. And so you can expect that the flood event has, is still t uh, in progress, or it will happen soon. The red one denotes where you have an ongoing flood, or the, sorry, the, the circles denote when you have an ongoing flood, and the downwards pointing is when the, the flood is receding. So, and uh, this system has been uh, developed uh, from our land surface model. So here we actually are using our own numerical weather prediction model. We take the output from the land surface model. I mentioned before the problem with data simulation, so that's still in there, so you should be a bit careful when using this one. But it is routed through a network uh, to produce flood, uh, probabilities of flood events on, on a global scale. In, in this one, we are using our HTESL land surface model, which is coupled with the IF. So it's a part of the whole uh, integrated forecast system. So it's a, op this operational land surface model that's used in, in the ECNWF. So, uh, well. so this is a distinction between rainfall runoff and landfall model. Yeah. yeah. So the distinction is just that. Uh, Basically, they come from two different scales, I would say. From hydrology, you d developed catchment models on a very small scale, and they have been now developed into sort of continental scale hydraulical models, whereas the, the land surface models have gone the other way around. They started on sort of the global scale, even though, and then they, they, they can now be used also for very catchment based information. So, but they have been developed for two different uh, purposes. The land surface model has developed to, to uh, take care of the, the the con so the interface between the land and the boundary, boundary layer, so to get a good uh, interaction with the atmosphere. So what happens with the soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and uh, all of that. So it's not designed to give a good response in terms of runoff. So in the hydraulic community, the runoff, rainfall runoff models that have been developed, they are very focused on producing a good rain a runoff uh, signal. Very depending on, on, there's some hydraulic models that look very much like a land surface model. Uh, they are just a bit more complex in terms of uh, groundwater. There is hydraulic models which are basically just a black box. So you can have everything in between as well. So you can have, they can, a hydraulic model can contain much more of statistical relationships. So it's not everything is uh, described in, in a physical way. They are more distributed models, yes. They also contain a lot of parameters that you can play around with as well. They, they do need some tuning, as you call it, or calibration to, to perform well. What about the soil column? So the land surface will be like a three different soil column, and the hydrological model can have more depth or infiltration? In, the, in, this, in our case, we have four soil layers. Uh, For the land yeah. But that can differ as well between different models. It's not set that you have to do it this way, it's just the way that they have decided to do it. Um, but they don't, usually they do not have a, a connection with the groundwater. So whatever is um, discharged out of the land surface model is just, you know, disappearing. Whereas in a hydraulic model, you can have also interaction with, this, with the groundwater. So you have much more complexity in how the water is transferred in the in the soil in the ground usually for the hydrological, for the hydrological model. model yes so you have that more complex model the european system 
Yes. Yes, but we, are, we will develop the global one as well, but we just to set it up as it, as it was. So it was there. We, we had a global system which gave us runoff, so we thought well, we'd just use it just in a, with the, together with the routing scheme to produce a discharge output. So it, that's why I say it's still a very much a research project, but it's been proved to be quite useful anyway in some cases. So uh, we have looked at... Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, the grid size, uh, the, uh, the routing is done on a 0.1, kilometer, uh, 0.1 degree, so it's about 10 kilometer. And what's the difference between this structure model and the uh, bridge model that we have in the US? Uh, they are very similar. They just have differences in, in how they uh, have set up their, their system. So. The, the, the good thing about this one is it's integrated into the, into the forecast directly. Whereas Vic, you have to, to run by having some sort of forcing. But here we get it from directly from the operational. How do you calibrate this model? Uh, yeah, I can show the next slide here. We've actually done some calibration. So <laughs> moving on to that one. It's, uh, you can, we haven't really calibrated the, the physics of the model. That's yet to be done if you want to treat it as, as an hydraulic model. The problem is if you do that, you will also influence the, the uh, uptake of the plants and the vegetation and, and the vapor transpiration. So we have to show that whatever we do in the land surface model does not deteriorate the actual forecast. So it's a bit tricky. What we've done here is we've taken the model and run it offline, forced by, by um, error interim on the global scale. So in that case, we can just focus on the, how the model performs without data simulation, just in any river. So we do get a good signal basically in the larger rivers. Um, on the smaller scale, it doesn't really work, perform that well. But on, on the Amazon, for example, we get a very good signal to, to work there. But that's, that's not so difficult to do, to be honest, because it's very driven by the, the seasonal cycle anyway. So, But there's, there's a big challenge in, in, I would say, in calibrating this model. So the, you're hitting a very good point there, that we, are, we need to calibrate it to uh, make it more hydrological useful. But we have used it, and it's used by the, the World Food Program, for example, when, they are, uh, when there's an oncoming or ongoing flood event. They can see whether they need to dis dispatch um, extra um, help to the people or to, to do something. So they can use this system to see what they can anticipate in certain areas. And it is available for anybody to use as well. All you need to do is go to this website and, and register. And for the course of this, for, the, for this training now, for in this workshop, you can use this, this username and this password. It's, it's a global password for a global username. So if you log in and use this and change something, the next person logging in will, will have the, those changes. So beware that this is just for, for this week now, if you want to look at the, the system and what it produces. What it can be used for as well is to, to validate your, your um, uh, it's, it's an independent evaluation of the forecast as well. It's for this week. But, but if you want to, just... To Friday, or? to Friday, yes. Yeah. So if you just go ahead and, and uh, use this. Uh, but if you want to register, send the, this, this, so you can go to this website and they, you can register as a user and then you will get to know your own password, personal password, so you don't have to use this one. But this is for, for this purpose of this training course. Now you can use this one. So um, we are developing the system and we are mainly developing the European system at the moment. But we will put a lot of effort in the next coming years into the global system as well. And some of the things we have introduced is a mul we are looking at the multimodal hydrology, not only in the driving data, but also in the hydraulic model. But I will show now some results from, from when we're trying to take this onto the seasonal scale as well. So it could be more interesting for you to, to see that, that study. So um, we are doing now with the European system up to 15 days, flash flood and flood warnings. And we want to see if we can use it for applications on the longer time scales. The obvious um, Customers for this information will be the hydropower management. Um, you can also use it for spring flood predictions, maybe for low pro predictions for navigation, agriculture, water needs. So there's a lot of things you can use uh, seasonal hydraulic model output for. 
And we're getting an increase in, in the, the skill from the numerical embedded prediction model. So we think that we can actually try to make this step now, go to this, to the seasonal time scale as well. So the aim of this study is to, to use the, we're starting off by using our um, seasonal forecast. So the, the uh, seven month uh, uh, European seasonal forecast model to, to, to provide probabilistic forecasts for, for beyond 15 days. And we set up the system in a way that we, um, we're comparing our seasonal forecast, which is for the right here. That's the, um, we're using the, Hein, the full Heinkast system of the seasonal forecast. We're running it through our list flood model, which is the hydrological model. So we are not using the operational land surface. This is, this is still a hydrological model. And then we come up with a seasonal ensemble prediction. But we also want to compare that against uh, how, what happened if you used observations. So we're also using, um, observational data, which we pull out from this database uh, so on, on, at a random order. So we are producing a climatological uh, ensemble, which will run, run through our hydraulical model to produce something we call ensemble stream, stream flow prediction. So that's our base flow, or the, or the base system to compare against. And uh, the other question was, how should we um, look at the scores and dissemination of this one? So we decided to uh, look on weekly catchment averages. Now we're moving beyond 15 days. We have to go a bit larger in time and, and space. And we're looking at seasonal changes, uh, DJF, well, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And we're concentrating for the moment on the lead time eight, one to eight weeks. So what happens on these first two months? And we are comparing against our, our model climatology in the, run by the perfect forecast, which is the observed precipitation and temperature. And the strategy of evalu evaluating this one, so we are interested in this well to see how much of the meteorological forcing um, versus the initial conditions matter. So if you have just the uh, perfect forecast running here, which is this, this here, run by observational t precipitation and temperature. If you then attach to that your climatological forecast or your seasonal forecast, you will get a stream flow prediction that will differ in time, over time. And the, the observations may look, go somewhere like, like this. Now I'm, I'm using only the climatological forecast, so this is not the seasonal forecast. So this is, this is going to look like this in, in, uh, if you just take uh, 15 years from the past and run through your model. And this is the way that uh, this has been done in, in, uh, in the past quite often. This is to just to see the, what we can expect, starting from the correct initial conditions and then running through the um, climatological past. Now, if you just do it the other way around instead, so we pick up 15 years from, the, from our climatology and we run that by the perfect meteorological forcing, you would see that in the beginning, you will, of course, have a big disparity in, in where you're starting from. But in time, you will uh, catch up with, it, with, uh, with your perfect run as well. And you can compare these two and see where, you, where do you, this variation in the initial condition becomes less than the variation in the metrological forcing. So you can see how long, on what lead time, does your initial conditions really matter. So the results from this study, and this is looking at comparing now the seasonal forecast, which is the dynamical model, the system four from ECNWF in green, and the blue is the climatological forecast. On average, both systems do produce a skill up to eight weeks, and you can see that the skill in the first two, well, the first weeks here is basically a lot to do with initial conditions. So even if you take your model and just run it with historical data, you will have a skill, just because you have a good starting point, good initial conditions. But you will have a, a little bit of advantage using the seasonal forecast over time. And some catchments will be better than others, of course. I will show that on, on a geographical scale as well. Yes. But it is more accurate than just using the climatology. We want to beat the climatology, obviously. Otherwise, there would be no point. And this is looking over Europe, and Europe is not very good in terms of seasonal predictability, unfortunately. We, we do, won't expect to have a lot more than beyond these four to eight weeks. And if you compare then uh, with the, uh, the reverse ES, ESP, where we looked at 
with perturbing initial conditions, but then have a perfect forecast. That's shown here in purple. It will start off quite badly, but then after, after a while you will um, beat the, the other systems because you're now forcing it with a perfect forecast. So you can see here that it takes up to two weeks before you have uh, lost the, the signal from the initial conditions, or where, where those really matter. So you can see where, where you have a the break point between initial conditions and, and measurable forcing. Oh, sorry, KGE is, uh, is a skill score. It's called the Kling Gupta skill score. It's looking at the correlation and the, the uh, uh, also the mean, mean, uh, mean error of the forecast. What's the score of the Kling Gupta? Uh, it's just uh, it's, uh, something that was, it was a development of another score called Nash Sutcliffe. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I mean, sometimes catchment doesn't have any memory at all. They just are completely rainfall driven. No, exactly. Yeah. But. Uh, this is showing a bit of, of the difference between seasons as well. So in the summer, we really have much shorter memory in the system. Uh, they are quite equal in terms of skill. And, uh, but in the wintertime, we do get a, a much better... Uh, we have a better forecast in, in the winter. Sorry, in the winter, you have a longer memory. No, sorry. In the winter, you have a higher skill in the forecast. That's what I should say. I will talk about the memory later, but in the winter we, we do have a higher predictability in, in, the, in, in the rainfall. And that is shown in other studies as well, that for, for winter time in Europe we do have a better skill than in summertime, because the winter time is more driven by the, the large scale circulations. In summertime you have a lot more influence from local conditions. Uh, this, uh, this is done by the, this is a seasonal forecast. So I don't think the seasonal, seasonal is not, it's not in a ticket database. So this is the... For the, the European uh, 15 days... No, this is, uh, this is the, this is going up to uh, seven months. So this is using a seasonal forecast. I'm just concentrating on the first eight weeks now at the moment, but it's, it's run by the seasonal forecast. For the last slides that you showed. Yeah. It's like the uh, it's not a ticket database. It is a seasonal forecast of of European Centre, which is in the S2S as well, is it? Or no? Okay. This is a, this is not a, the ticket database. So we haven't. We are going. To, we have implemented the the, um, uh, the monthly forecast as well, but we haven't yet analysed the results from that. So this this would probably get a higher skill as well. But we have a the, the monthly forecast we should update much more frequently. So this is just looking at the first chart that what how much can we get from just using the seasonal forecast. But we do the same kind of uh, analysis with the, also with the monthly forecast. Yeah. No, this is the raw raw output. So, as Adrian pointed out, there's a big difference in, in where you are as well. So, now we're looking at the CRPSS. Uh, so, it's looking at at which week in the forecast do the CRPSS, which is a skill score, looking at the whole probabilistic forecast, uh, go below zero. So, if you have a very white color here, it means that you lose skill quite quickly. If you have a blue color, you have a higher skill longer, up to eight weeks here. So we can see that some catchments, especially in the winter time, we have a quite um, long lead time of skill. So we can have a skill up to seven, eight weeks, actually, in the forecast. In the summer, the situation is much more locally driven, so we, we, we are losing a lot more skill. So it's, we can see that it's much more useful for the winter, winter season.
You would, yes, but we are looking at sort of lead, averaging over a week, and there's, there's some rivers in Europe that had the kind of uh, concentration time of longer than a week, but they're not very many, so most of the rivers will have shorter than one week response. But it, it does depend as well on, on the, um, how long it takes for the water to reach the mouth of the river, yes, it does. And that can also be affected by if you have reservoirs or lakes, for example, that would influence your results. And um, then comparing the, the uh, seasonal forecast against our, our um, base, base, uh, benchmark forecast, uh, the extreme, uh, the ensemble prediction system with just the climatology, we can see here, looking at the skill score of uh, CRPSS, if it's above zero, we, we can say that we have a skill. If it's below zero, we are worse or, or as bad as the climatology. You can see here that the, we have a skill for up to three to four weeks from any catchment. This is averaging over all the catchments. You see also this influence of the of initial conditions in week one, that both systems are really performing equally good in week one, but then you get to week two, you actually get an increase in skill due to the fact that you are, you, you are picking up of the meteorological um, predictability in week two. And if you compare low flows with high flows, uh, the, this is looking at uh, the rock score, which is another skill score that we are using as well counting the number of hits and uh, misses in a, in a forecasting system. We're looking now at the uh, flows below and above the 95 and 5th percentile. So the green one here is the low flow. So everything is below the 5th percentile in your, in your forecast. And you can see that the... Um, uh, oh, sorry, this is the seasonal forecast. So the green... The, the, uh, uh, triangles is the fifth percentile, and the uh, round one is the 95th percentile. So this is de depicting the low flow, and this is the high flow. And you can see we have a better predictability of the low flows than the high flows. So we do have, we can have a more, um, more trust in the low flows of the system. And we can see also that the uh, seasonal forecast is beating the climatological forecast over most of these lead times. And then, so finally, a slide here on what, what is the, um, where does this predictability come from? So we're looking now at a, a measure called critical lead time, which is basically when the variability in your climatology is larger than the variability in your um, forecasting system. So if you have a very um, white number here, you have your variability of your climatology is much more important. So you have very little uh, effect of the, of the meteorological forcing. So the effects will come all from the initial conditions in the model. And if you have a high number here, very blue, uh, you have a longer um, gain from, from using your system. From, uh, you have much more influence from the initial conditions. Sorry. So if you have a blue, you have a much more influence from the initial conditions. If you have a white, everything is decided by the meteorological forcing. So these areas here in winter time is, uh, do have a much more influence of initial conditions due to that they are groundwater fed during winter time. So they, they are not so affected by what happens in terms of the uh, meteorological forcing. But snow is, a snow is, is, is rather, rather important, but also during winter time these are quite low flows anyway. So they're mostly runoff that also already stored in the, in the groundwater. Mostly frozen on the, on the soil, but you still have running water beneath it. Whereas if you look at the, the western side of the, of the Nordic countries, you have much more westerly winds. So here the, the meteorological forcing will be much more important than the... So here, here the catchment that Adrian talked about, the small catchments which have low memory. And in the Mediterranean, you also have the same thing in the winter time. You have precipitation-driven flows during winter. And some areas that come up, like uh, Spain in, in summertime, you have the, the uh, drier moisture conditions that are important than the, the forcing itself. So if you have a very dry soil, they can, um, they can hold the water much better. They have much more capacity of absorbing the precipitation. And then you have, finally, these snowmelt-driven discharges during spring and summer for the Nordic countries as well. So there's a large difference in variability, in variability between these catchments, depending on how they... If the, if the initial conditions or the meteorological forcing is important. 
so the message from this one is that you, you have a gain in using the seasonal forecast from, I would say, one to four weeks of lead time, especially in winter time. And you do have a better skill in the low flows um, than, the up, than the high flows. But we do have, some, have an advantage using the seasonal forecast from the climatology. So we get, we get a gain in skill. And the uncertainty from the initial conditions is, um, uh, yeah, you, you have a transition between hydraulical states as well, which is a crucial part of this process as well. So, Okay, so that was my talk. Thank you very much.